I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm just thrilled to have you all here. Um, and especially a huge shout out to my wonderful panelists, Hershey Millette Stevens and Lisa Brown. Um, as is our tradition in lifelong learning um, and as part of our liturgy, we are going to start in prayer together. Um, Hershey, would you, would you mind reading our parable for us? Parable of the sowers. He said many things to them in parables. A farmer went out to scatter seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell on the path and birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where the soil was shallow. They sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it scorched the plants and they dried up because they had no roots. Other seed fell among the thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked them. Other seed fell on good soil and bore fruit. And in one case, a yield of 100 to one. In another case, a yield of 60 to one. And in another case, a yield of 30 to one. Everyone who has ears should pay attention. And Lisa, can you start us in prayer? Sure. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you as a people of God, seeking to join your transforming work in the world. Open our eyes to see the movement of the spirit. Open our minds to imagine new possibilities. Open our ears to hear the voices of all your children. Open our mouths to speak with honesty and love. Open our hands to share all that we have. Open our hearts to receive all that we need. Thank you, Lord, for calling us as your disciples and friends. Give us courage to follow where you lead. Amen. 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 I say shout out to the Becoming Beloved Community curriculum for that prayer. Um, very grateful that Hershey did all of that amazing work and gathered some great resources, as did Dave Pritchard. So thank you, guys. Um, so welcome. Welcome to um, our second webinar of the program year sponsored by the Lifelong Learning Department at Virginia Theological Seminary. So my name is um, Sarah Stonecipher and I'm the Digital Missioner and Manager of Operations um, here in the Lifelong Learning Department. Um, we are on a Zoom webinar and we are also live on Facebook. Um, so we're going to be taking questions from both places. And um, the best way to communicate with, uh, with my wonderful panelists, with Hershey and Lisa, is actually through um, the chat box. Um, which on Zoom, it should be just below our faces and, um, and below the screen sharing. Um, and then on Facebook, it would be via the comments um, as we go on. I will be the um, hostess with the mostess, and so hopefully we, I can gather the questions as they come in. Um, please feel free to comment um, and, to, and to chime in. I swear Lisa and Hershey and I can see them and we're not ignoring them, even though we may not uh, address them directly. Um, as is uh, our process with all of our webinars, we send out a follow-up email with all of our resources and slides and um, amazing um, uh, contextual information about 20, 24 to 48 hours afterwards. So you will get that in your inbox right after, um, right after we finish up. So I'm thrilled to have Lisa Brown and Hershey Millette Stevens um, uh, as, as our panelists. I'm excited that we are both gonna talk about storytelling and digital storytelling and how those, they really come down to their root of being the same thing. Um, so Lisa and Hershey, can you just give yourselves a brief intro? Sure. I am the Director of Digital Ministry for Membership Vision, which means I help churches tell their stories in the digital space. And it is really my great delight to work with churches all across the country and learn their stories and what we have in common and what's different. And I actually got into this work because my now business partner, the first thing he ever said to me was, tell me a story about your church. And I was like, oh, oh, this is good work. So that's my I'm Hershey Millette Stevens and I'm co-creator of the Beloved Community Story Sharing Campaign. Shout out to Dave, my partner in crime. Um, and I really fell in love with stories tagging along going to AA meetings and it was there that I learned the transformative power of stories and how knowing your story can propel 
can propel your life in a completely different direction. So um, I like to say in the rooms I learned about resurrection and I knew something was really important about stories, um, even as a kid, because when I would go home, my sisters and brothers and I would play AA with our little baby dolls. Um, and, and so ever since then, you know, I've had a passion and uh, really um, a desire to help other people cultivate their own story. Wonderful. Um, and we are just going to go ahead and jump in. We are joined um, online with almost 80 people um, on the Zoom webinar, and then it looks like we have 15 watching on Facebook. So thank you all so much for joining us about this really important topic that really, like, it, it, it is information, it is in discipleship, and it is in evangelism. So I'm excited that we can sort of merge all of those um, buckets together as one big one. All right, so take it away, ladies. <laughs> All right, so this is an illustration from one of my favorite children's books. Um, I am a child of books by Oliver Jeffers, and I am a child of God, but I am definitely a child of books. And I absolutely love this illustration, all that ever was and will be just spewing out from the globe. And my kid is actually a physicist, and he tells me that the universe is expanding and expanding at an increasingly rapid pace. And theologically, I love this and I'm so inspired by this because I think of our role and the invitation God offers us to be co-creators in this expanding, evolving, and ever-changing universe. And I truly believe that stories are the building blocks of that universe. And so as we think about stories, um, the question you may be asking is, why tell your story? And I like to think that we tell stories because um, one is they're a part of our identity. And so it's important to put effort into remembering your story and telling it. Um, and you think, oh, I don't need to do that. I was there, I know what happened. But you know, we all know if you have journaled just the act of writing down your daily, you know, the things that happened to you that day or remembering a specific moment has a salient, um, has, you know, the power to kind of bring to, to mind emotions that you are feeling. So it is important to put, put some effort into remembering your story. And I think that that can be a tool for evangelism and for your own spiritual, um, your own spiritual work. This is one of my favorite memes that I found on Facebook. Sometimes images tell stories. Um, and if you've ever read the story of, of, of Jesus at Cana, then this image reminds you of that story, but in a modern way. So as you begin to tell your stories, you know, don't feel restricted to words. And just um, I, as, as we think about pictures, I, I also, I uh, want to encourage you to think about the images that you create in your everyday life and how putting prayerful memory into an effort into remembering your story and telling your story and communicating it well can be a wellspring of wisdom um, and become effective tools for evangelism and reconciliation. This is one of my favorite pictures of, of a woman who taught me a lot about telling your story, uh, Sister Promise uh, at Trinity Wall Street. And just one last reminder about remembering things and, and why we remember. I love this quote from Justo Gonzalez. He says, it's not a matter of taking the past and reinventing it according to our whims and desires. It's rather a question of looking at the past with new eyes to see whether we find in it something that others precisely because they did not have the same lens have not seen or having seen did not consider important. And I think this is, a skill that we learn um, and that we practice in hearing the gospel read over and over, returning to our holy scriptures time and time again, year after year as we move through the cycle of um, the, the, the Anglican cycle of prayer and also as we move through the cycle of the church year. You know, what, what do we remember or see 
with new eyes um, from our stories and how might we mine our stories for uh, new understandings and a deeper and more um, a deeper and more inclusive expansive understanding of the word of God so I love these two statements uh, the first one stories orient and inspire us was actually spoken by the former provost of my university who was an astrophysicist. We're talking all about physicists today, I don't know why. Um, but I love it because sometimes we might dismiss stories and say, well, they're just entertainment. Or we might think of stories simply as something we generate for the consumption of other people. When in fact, I think that first stories orient and inspire us picks up on what Hershey was talking about is the power of story to shape our own identity to shape the collective identities that we share with other people and also to help us understand our place in the world. I mean, that's what it means to be oriented. Um, and the other quote on here that I love is C.S. Lewis, we have eternity written in our hearts. And it speaks to how we as humans crave being part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think so much of the stories that we do consume as entertainment, you know, whether it's the Marvel Universe, Harry Potter, C.S. Lewis, Lord of the Rings, all these big epic stories. Why do we love those? Whether they're books or movies or whatever, we crave being part of something bigger than we are. And here we are as people of the ongoing story of the people of God, the most epic story ever. So we've got an epic story to tell and share with people. And I think we tell, I mean, there's many, many ways you can differentiate the kinds of stories that we tell. But I like to think about them in four different ways. Number one, we have the foundational stories of our faith, which is scripture. Um, you know, and obviously we read that during our services, but this would also include godly play and a lot of our Bible studies and when we act them out at our stained glass windows. Then we have the denominational lens of how we interpret scripture along with like our tradition, our governments, our worship, our history in our denominations. And I think this is a really important one today because for some denominations, the predominant media narrative of what Christianity is may not be the same as their denominational narrative. I know like I'm Episcopalian. The Episcopalian narrative is different from some of the other media narratives that people might hear about Christianity. So the denominational level is an important level of storytelling. Then there's congregational storytelling. Now, when I ask a congregation, tell me a story about your church, half the time they're like, we started in 1802, and I'm like, I don't care. What I care about is who are you in your community today? Because who you are right now isn't who you were 10 years ago. Who your community is isn't who it was 10 years ago. So there's not only a geographic, but a very temporal um, kind of uh, component of congregational stories. And then finally, the individual stories of how God is transforming our lives. And here's the thing, transformation is intriguing. When we see that other people have been transformed, we're like, how do I get some of that? How do I make, how can I be transformed? So really, I mean, that's evangelism and understanding also for your identity your story is the story of God, the God of creation at work in the world today. We are part of that epic story. And I love Lisa's four, four blocks. Before we go to, to the next image, I love Lisa's four buckets to think about. And I, don't, I just don't want us to think about them linearly because we're going in and out of those four and those four spaces all the time. Perhaps it is the, the denominational story of the Episcopal Church that drew you back to church or into, into Christian community, and, and then you go learn more about the found, foundational stories. Or perhaps you've had a huge transformational moment, uh, like the moments I was talking about that people shared in the rooms when I was a kid, and that led you into a community of worship and then and, you know to find out more about the denomination. And, and simultaneously, you're learning more about those uh, foundational stories that we tell in our scripture. So, you know, I love those four buckets because it kind of cleans up all the stories that are swirling around in our life. Um, but I just want to 
encourage you all not to like think of them so linearly because they're happening all at the same time um, and it's a part of the the richness of um, stories and and it's just also like I think a great way to um, help you know like they are happening at the same time but it's also a great way to kind of help clarify um, as you as you begin your own reflections so now we can go to my one of my favorite images so as we think about foundational stories, um, I want us to just take a moment and reflect. This is uh, this is a, a, a painting of the people of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt, crossing the River Jordan, and in it, I'm so drawn to it because I just I I think about these individual people on on the riverbed. And I just want everyone to take a moment and find themselves in the picture. Like, are you walking close to the fire? Like, that's where I would be because my feet are always cold and I'm, no matter what's happening, I'm cold even if I'm outside. Or are you close to the edge because you hate being boxed in or feeling claustrophobic? Lisa, where are you? I'm probably up towards the front because I can't hear and I like to know what's going on and you know, I want the directions, so I'm probably up front. Sarah, do you know where you are? Oh, Sarah is fancy. I know. We, we, we put arrows for where we would be. <laughs> um, I think that I said that I would be in the back making sure that people herded and got, and got to where they needed to go before I ended up um, going, going through the water myself. Oh, yes. I remember we called you the tribe of Daniel, making sure no <laughs> one got left. Sarah is bringing the people on through. And all, all of those years of youth ministry where I needed to count heads all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this is a fun way to, you know, um, I think as a group, if you, you know, as you begin to start thinking about your stories, if you want to do some reflection, find some images online of, of the foundational stories that we know and begin to imagine yourself in them um, and think about if you were there, how, you know, what about you would inform this story that is living in your heart right now? So one of the big questions for a lot of us, whether we're formation folks or communication folks, and that's the background I'm coming from um, in parish minister as the director of children's ministry and the communications coordinator um, for a very long time. And so thinking how do we kind of organizationally um, tell these stories? And what's really interesting is, and this goes back to speaking of that temporal piece, all of these pictures that I've captured from my time at St. Paul's and Mount Lemon are 10 years old. So these are stories that are part of my past, not stories of my future. But there's some things that kind of differentiate individual storytelling, I think, from communal and collective and organizational storytelling. And, and, and also, I think, as we're talking about this, particularly for organizations, our best storytelling opportunities are often in the digital space. So we really want to kind of pivot into thoughts about digital storytelling. So the first thing we have to address, I am a reader and I am a writer. We are people of the book. In the beginning was the word, I am Episcopalian. We will like fight to the death over the words in our book of common prayer, words, words, words. But we have to think about, as Hershey mentioned earlier, and even just the power of that exercise we just did um, with the Red Sea. When we're thinking about storytelling, we need to be thinking about visual storytelling. And that's just, it's really, really important right now. Um, and so you can jump to the next slide. You know, we might say, um, well, visual storytelling, you know, it's really important to the, the younger generational cohorts, right? Because they're the ones that are using, you know, Snapchat and Instagram. What I would argue is that visual storytelling does extend across all generational cohorts. And even where you might say, oh, well, our church, they're older. They're not so involved in the technology platforms. I would argue that if they're not, then we're not telling compelling enough stories. And I love this image because it speaks to that. You know, you've got the little baby and it looks like mom's hands and they look like they're FaceTiming or whatever with great grandma. So, you know, you've got four generational cohorts right there. Um, 
And I think that speaks to how if there's a compelling enough reason, a compelling enough story, people are going to figure the technology out or they're going to ask somebody to help them. They're going to make it happen. And, and the other thing that I want to think about when we use the digital space, we're so used to thinking about it informationally, you know, the information age, right? If I do one thing today, if I can help people shift their understanding of the digital space from the informational to the relational, we want to use the digital space relationally. Now, you still have to have correct information because if I get on your website and you don't have the correct time for the service and I show up and nobody else is there, like we're not going to have a relationship because I don't trust you. But we still want to think about in all of our digital communications, what is the story I'm telling and how does this help me form relationships? So a couple caveats to think about. Next slide, please. Um, so coming back to those four different levels of storytelling, we want to think in visual imagery, imagery I mean, representation matters. Um, we want to think about how do we represent the holy and who can represent the holy. So it becomes very important, I think, in our visual storytelling to make sure we are as broadly inclusive of all the people of God as possible. Um, so I, I think, you know, in that regard, it's really, and I, I think that really helps. I know when we're sharing stories with children, for example, and we might show them, let's say picture books that have different depictions. I think that helps them really enter the story and see themselves in the story. It helps anybody, not just children, when we recognize that there's not only one way to depict a story, particularly at the scriptural level. Where it gets a little challenging, next slide please, is when we wanna think about how do we represent ourselves and the people who are currently in our congregation? And I think the key phrase here is authenticity. You have to represent who you are. Um, and, you know, I've had people say, but we, we, we want to, we welcome everyone and we aspire to have more diversity, whatever that might, might mean in your context, in our congregation. Well, if you don't have kids and all your pictures are stock images of children, it's not an authentic representation of who you are. Um, on the other hand, storytelling gives us a great opportunity, again, to push back against some of those media narratives that, that you know, might not, that, that we can say, that's not how we are, this actually is. And I love this image um, from a church in New York. They've got their clergy person and their, their congregation is out marching the pride parade with a fierce little kid in front. And it's very, that's what I was going to say, and now she's a bishop. Um, somebody just popped up mentioning that. And I love this because this pushes back on some negative um, depictions of Christianity that are not as inclusive and affirming. So I think you need to be authentic to who you are um, without kind of overstating that. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing we need to think about if we are telling congregational stories or institutional stories, how do we weave in individual stories as part of that because again that's what it's that's what it's all about i love saying to churches who owns your story you know and they're like jesus and i'm like well but jesus is not posting on your instagram so let's let's try again so we need to move away from a broadcast model where the head pastor the priest the rector controls the story and very carefully filters it out how do we invite more people into telling their stories as part of our collective lives together and amplify those voices. A great example of that um, was from the Evangelism Matters Conference in Texas, and everybody had these flip sides. It was like, I was lost, flip, I was found. And it was a really great exercise, and there's a link to the video that was created from that. And again, these are stories of transformation. Now, comparing this to a welcome video, and I'm gonna pick on all you like rectors and lead pastors out there, of you sitting in your office, talking about your church and how great it is, as opposed to people who are saying, my life was transformed, my life was transformed, my life was transformed. So that's a way that we might think about using individual stories as a, in a collective way. Um, what was I going to talk about? Them? Again, this is just um, an example of a church that did that, inspired by that video, St. Michael's in Arlington. They said to people, why do you keep coming back? And they took actual pictures like these are real parishioners in their real handwriting. 
And so that's been a way for them to form new relationships with people coming into their community. Now, again, thinking of, of what makes a good picture, so I'm going to pivot a little bit here. I always tell people that you want to think about people, purpose, and place. So many churches have, as we're seeing St. John's here, a picture of their building on the front of their website, which in many ways is informational and boy, we love our buildings, we're proud of our buildings, um, but it's not relational. And now St. John's, if anybody was going to be allowed to do this, it would be them. They are in the Grand Tetons. It is the most gorgeous place on God's green earth. But would you rather go here or, big reveal, or would you rather be part of these people? So this is the same church. These are their real people. You get, you know, the purpose. Love is all you need. They've got dogs. Dogs are internet gold people. If you can have a dog in your picture, do it. And the antler arch is a very iconic part of their community. So this says, we are these people. This is what we believe in. We're part of your community. This is a, this is a great story right here. Um, I don't know. Oh, and while we were, were planning for this, um, we heard the voice of Charlotte Greason from Beyond going, St. James in LA has, really, has a really good Instagram account or Facebook account. And so we all pulled it up and we were all like, Ooh, I, I, I want to I wanna go to church with these folks. This, these look like people I could sit in the pews with, um, you know, and be a part of this. Well, and what I love about, especially like St. James and the, and the photo of um, St. John's, is, is that that big welcome statement that a lot of churches put on, like, is the first thing you see. I love them. There are a lot of words. And I'm like, I'm a skeptic, you know. I'm like, really? Is that really true? But I think you can see the love, you know. You can see the love that people have for each other. You can see the care they have for one another. Their arms are around one another. And you want to be a part of a community like that. So I think these pictures, you know, communicate that God's love is, enacted in the community um, and they com they communicate that the story of love is active and growing and that it is waiting for you. So the final slide I threw in here was like the big question mark. So what are your stories? What are the stories that the world needs to hear? What are the stories that would surprise people about your church? What are the stories and Hershey, was, was this a question that you asked in one of your workshops? What are you excited about? Was that one of your questions? I'm not, you know, I'm so ADD. It could have been. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could have been. Hershey asked brilliant questions. And I loved in workshops that I've done with Hershey, she, she asked some really great questions to elicit some different stories. You know, so instead of this gets back to that, if I say, tell me a story about your church, we're starting in 1802. Whereas if I say, what are you excited about? That gets a different answer, and excitement invites other people. Um, you know, like I said, what are the best kept secrets about your church? And what are the stories that people in your community need to hear and long to hear and want to hear? So that's kind of all, all I've got for now, if we're ready to conclude or open it up for questions or whatever we're doing. Yeah, and so um, these were, do you want to go through and share about each of these um, resources? Because these are just, um, these are like little nuggets of gold. Um, so I know I mentioned the Beloved Community Story Sharing Project that Hershey and Day wrote, and that's where I got the prayer from. And it is a curriculum about how to go about asking people to share their stories. Um, and while Hershey and Lisa are going through the res these resources, um, go ahead, um, those of you who are on Zoom with the chat or those of you who are on Facebook, um, I am ready to go and have, um, and, and we'll, I'll get these lined up, these questions lined up for you all. So go ahead and let them flow in while they describe their resources. Um, so StoryPath is an, a resource that is is uh, relatively new to me, but one that I've, I've really enjoyed using, especially with small children. Um, they suggest books that aren't necessarily Christian books, but just kind of classic childhood stories that echo um, the themes in our, in our uh, traditional foundational stories. And StoryPath follows the, um, the lectionary calendar. Um, so there are a lot of fun things in there, and I'm, I was really excited about it at, when I used to preach at 
um, children's chapel, a children's chapel service. I, I love using classics like um, going on a bear hunt, you know, to talk about fear and how we can't go over it, can't go under it. We got to go through it and Jesus helps us go through it. So that's a really cool resource. Um, and I, I thought I was preaching to children, but all the parents really were like, I never thought about it like that before. So maybe use it with adults. Um, and then one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, YouTube um, kind of uh, a TED talk is um, The Danger of a Single Story by Chichimande Adichie. And she does a wonderful job of, of talking about how one story um, pushes people away and, and, or locks people out of connection. Um, and it's, it's about 15 minutes. It doesn't take long. Um, and I think that once you watch it, you may have some ideas about how to uh, diversify the stories in your community. And, you know, this is a shameless plug for beloved community story sharing. There, there are exercises there to help solicit stories so that your, your uh, faith community won't have a single story. You know, how do families get to your church? You know, you can ask people about their baptisms or about their weddings, things that happen at your church to kind of find, you know, a, there may be a red line or a theme running through, um, a red thread running through all of those stories, but having them together, you know, collecting those stories, I think helps you avoid the danger of a single story as in, you know, at Saints Withens, we always do X. And if you don't do that, then you're not welcome. Did you talk about beloved story or beloved community? Do you want to do that first? I, I did. I did just mention it, um, okay. but there's lots of there's lots of good things in there. So okay. we can go on to um, people, place, and purpose. You want to do that one, Lisa? Sure. And that's just a blog post I wrote, really summarizing this idea of people, place, and purpose, and showing some different examples. Um, and and one of the stories I always tell about that is even sometimes the things that we just kind of take for granted, we want to think about it speaks to that danger of a single story of what story a picture might represent to somebody else. I have a picture of a friend of mine um, who is a female Episcopal priest presiding over communion in her robes, you know, elevating the host. So it's pretty high church, you know, in the middle of church. So what's the story there? Well, I live in Western Pennsylvania and the majority of people here are Roman Catholic. And the number of women that I've had say to me after they've attended a service at my church, you know, for their nieces or their nephews, baptism or confirmation, and they've said, until I saw a woman elevate the host, it broke open something in me that I didn't even know existed. So, boy, there's a story in there that somebody needed to hear. Um, so, again, thinking about that. The other thing that I'm really excited about is the embracing evangelism um, curriculum that will be coming out. It's going to be released at the Rooted in Jesus conference in January 2020, which you totally want to go to. It's going to be awesome. And the whole premise of embracing evangelism is evangelism following a story-driven process, exactly what I've been talking about. And I'm going to read the exact quote of what this is all about. We seek name and celebrate Jesus' loving presence in the stories of all people, then invite everyone to more. So when people hear evangelism, this isn't about pounding other people over the head or stuffing your stories down their throat. This is about inviting them to share their story and helping them to see and name God in their stories because God is already present in their story. And then finally, there's the link to the, um, the cardboard testimonies from the Evangelism Matters uh, conference. So questions. What do we got, Sarah? All right. Um, Sarah Bentley already asked, in a small church, how do you start the storytelling, story sharing work? We don't have a communications person. Is she speaking about the digital storytelling? I think it could be a both and. Like, how do you get people to share their stories that either in person so that or so that they can be shared digitally? Well, I'll speak about the in person. I'm a really terrible millennial. Like, I don't do the digital thing a whole lot. So um, in, in the Beloved Community Story Sharing Guidebook, there are some um, ideas for communities that are kind of ready to 
to begin sharing their story. Um, and one of the ones that I really love, and I've, I've, I've tried it, um, actually, I, I submitted it after trying it at a um, Shrove Tuesday, but any gathering will work. Just putting on the table like a little tent card with a question to help people begin to talk to one another. And it's great for like the introverts in the room because, you know, sometimes it's like, I do want to talk to new people, but I don't, I never know where to start. So if you have some questions about like, what was your, do you remember your first Sunday at, at X church? Um, what's, what's your favorite hymn? It's always a wonderful one. I think music connects people. Um, and you could even just go, what's your favorite song and tell a story about why you love that song or what that song makes you think about. And, and that just kind of primes the pump for people to begin telling their stories. And there's also resources in the um, guidebook about story circles, um, which is a, a bit more guided, a bit more formal. Um, and I think once you begin telling those stories in person, uh, one, you have great, great uh, setup for images of people talking to one another in coffee hour and you just get someone to roll around with their phone and take pictures of these very animated conversations as they are promised to be. Um, and, and then I think once you begin telling personal stories, people will move on to telling the story of the community. Lisa, do you have something for, for those yeah. digital folks? Oh yeah, well, and a little bit of both. Um, one of the things when you're talking about story, t story sharing and, and doing that in small groups that I really like using um, there's, there's a set of visual cards that are basically like random stock photos. Um, visual Faith put together a like kind of predefined kit and you can buy those. And I'll be quite honest, I got on stock photo sites and printed out 250 random images for under 20 bucks, you know, at the Walmart photo kiosk. And so we'll ask one of these questions, like, what was the most you know, formative thing for you in your faith development as a child. And you throw all these pictures out there and you encourage people to pick up one and only for themselves and not two and not for anybody else and sit down and explain to somebody across from them why they chose that photo. And what we found is it, it digs a little deeper because maybe if you just asked me the question, I might have an idea of what I was going to say, but unless I can find a picture that represents that, or maybe I'll see a picture that'll trigger something else. So it definitely helps people go deeper. Um, so I like that. The other thing, and Sarah, I'll have to throw you a link on this that I like, and I'm going to contradict myself because I'm good at that. I'm a contemplative. I can hold different ideas in my head. Um, forget the visual for a minute and think about podcasting. A colleague of ours, Sandra Montez, over Lent, did these little podcasts that were like, 10 or 15 minutes and she asked 40 people across the Episcopal Church that she's friends with about their Lenten practices. And I am actually not a podcast person, but darn if I didn't listen to those because she interviewed me and I wanted to hear myself. And she interviewed all my friends. And so I have an article that isn't like, okay, let's start a storytelling podcast for it to go on and on and on forever. Do something episodic. Say we're going to do four weeks or six weeks of doing Lent or whatever. And we're going to do this and we're going to capture some of the founder stories and we're going to capture some intergenerational stories. And like everybody has a phone, you can, you can record these on your phone and it doesn't take much to clean them up. So I'll, I'll send a link on some thoughts on if you wanted to put together a podcast. Lisa, I love that. And I, I just want to commend Epiphany, I think is a like overlooked season, right? Like Yes. Epiphany, like what revelations have we had? I think Christmas is a time where people really want to get back into community and like, you know, they're looking to be in touch and we usually kind of take a deep breath after Christmas. But I mean, you could do an Epiphany podcast series right after and that, that might keep people engaged with your, your community. We, we might be doing that at St. John's. I see, and an epiphany is a time for storytelling. The idea of like the wise men, like going back to Herod and, you know, and, you know, the angels saying like, okay, now it's time for you to go and like share what you saw. Yeah. yeah. yeah amazing. Run um, tell that. That's what they say in the black church. What? Wait, what? Run I missed tell that. Go tell, go, th yes, go tell that, yes, go tell that, yes, 100%, that's exactly what it is. Um, a quick question, and we might have to do a follow-up on this one, will the Embracing Jesus courses also be available in Spanish? Lisa, do you remember? Yes, I'm saying yes, um, because I know a number of people who are participating in it are native Spanish speakers, Right. Um, so I'm saying yes. Yes. 
And, um, and we will also do a follow up on that. Um, and then we will report back in our follow up email. So thank you, Holly, for that question. And we will, we will get a more definitive answer on it. Um, all right, so next question come from, from, comes from Scott, who just came on at a pastor at a church with no digital footprint. Um, what formats will be the most advantageous for gathering these stories that I don't know because I am new? So here's the thing. That's a, that's a both and question. It's a both and. And, and it's, it's the, let's start with the ones that your people are actually using. If, you know, you have a church of 22 year olds and they're all on Instagram then you better be on Instagram. If it's empty nesters and people that are skewing a little bit older, it's more Facebook. Um, and the different platforms all have their pros and cons. I would never say to a church, you need to be on all of them because you're not going to do it all well. If you can't tell me why you're on each platform, be it, you know, I want to tell this story in this way and it's particularly suited to this platform and you're not ready to be there yet. I think a good website is absolutely essential. A Facebook page does not necessarily take the place of it because a website should be the hub and the repository for all of your digital communications. Everything should kind of tie back to the website. A Facebook page is very outward facing. One thing that we've found that has been um, helpful is having a Facebook group that is part of your Facebook page, and inviting your existing parishioners to be part of that. So like a close, not close, I guess private, Facebook group, and you have to be very clear what the purpose is. So like nobody's selling their home-based business stuff on there, but you say it's to lift one another up in prayer, to deepen our relationships, you know, to walk with each other on our Christian journey and tap your parishioners who are active on Facebook and be like, Hey, can you post a whatever? And really start encouraging people. And also you want to capitalize as far as creating content on what people are already doing. If you're doing a blessing of the animals, everybody's taking pictures. So facilitate getting those pictures. It's easier to build on what people are already doing than try to get people to change what they're doing and still build from there. And Ali, Ali Gannett, uh, Ali Gannett, that's the first time I've ever had to say her married name, um, who works for the Episcopal Church in Connecticut as their digital storyteller. Um, she says that podcasts and short blogs have been wonderful at the diocesan level. Um, I would commend the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, um, Instagram and Facebook to anybody. And she says that also utilizing Instagram TV um, and stories on Instagram or Facebook have been wonderful ways to share these short stories. And I would just suggest to Scott, who's trying to collect some new stories, use any meeting that you have mm -hmm. to get people to tell their stories. I have a mug in my office and it just has these like sentence starters in them. And yeah. some of them are silly, like when I think of prunes, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and some of them, are, you know, are like the hardest time for me to pray is dot, dot, dot. You know, just a way to get people talking, a way to get people sharing with one another, because we often kind of come into the meeting, we say our prayer, whether it's from the Book of Common Prayer, we pray extemporaneously, and then we move on to the next thing. But anytime you're gathering in a group, I say of three or more, you know, provide just a little space and time for people to tell a story, which can be just one or two two sentences, you know, or a one minute check-in. Um, and I think you'll find, then you'll learn some interesting things about the people uh, and the community that you're worshiping with. And then you'll, you'll also kind of pick up on who is, who is holding the, the treasure? Who is, who are the storytellers in, in the community? And it deepens your relationship. You know, you see this person that sits six pews over, because we all sit in the same, you know, same seats every Sunday. And then you share a story and all of a sudden that you, you see them completely different. It's it, stories are very transformative for relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and then Anne wants to um, chimed in and said, invite and invite and include the artist, photographers, digital artists in your congregation to share their images, hold a community art exhibit to start the conversation. Yeah, or even a community art day or art exploration, intergenerational art exploration around a theme. Absolutely. All yeah, in the beloved community story sharing guidebook, there's one exercise where you put photos that have been collected through generations, through the years out and allow people to look at them. And people will begin to tell the story, you know, just from looking at, at the pictures and the photos, you know, not only um, of the modern congregation, but of people who have inhabited that space through time. 
And somebody asked um, for the prompts, Hershey, in the mug. Um, did you find those just on a story sharing, storytelling website? No, or did I just, you just come I just, up with them I, randomly. I, I make them up. I'll email them to you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank and you. And I just kind of keep a running list of them. And so they'll that come is delightful. Out. out of Hershey's, out of Hershey's brain, straight onto the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so nosy. Like, we'll say curious. <laughs> well, you just, you just one once that I love to start a conversation, and, and you'll have to clarify for me. It was like something about what are you called and who are you in relationship with? Oh, yeah. And that's really different than like, hey, introduce yourself. Because yeah. I'll tell you what, I, I answered completely differently, and I loved that one. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I think nicknames tell a they Nicknames are a story in themselves, right? And and then who who are we in relationship with? kind of reveals you know the spread of our it's it's also a nosy question like who should we be evangelizing to who are you you know in in conversation with regularly so in pittsburgh we say that's being nebby i'm okay with that nebby nebby no i don't know that one i like it <laughs> All right, and I promise we'll share the follow-up prompts in the email. So that means that Hershey needs to send them. So I'll email them to you right now. Okay. All right. That's awesome. All right. So with that, um, I think we're we've come to a, a low point in questions, which is perfect timing because it is the time that we are supposed to end our webinar. I think that this like might have actually been the um, first webinar that we have ended relatively on time. So that's amazing. We're getting better at this. It's only taking three years. So thank you. Um, so our next webinar is about Sabbath and keeping Sabbath holy. Um, so this will be on October 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern and it will be let me just send you the link so then that way you can have it there is the link to go ahead and get all signed up and oh, I have to post it in Facebook too there we go double duty um, and um, so it will be a wonderful conversation including with Keith Anderson who just returned from his um, El Camino sabbatical um, so in case you're ready for very picture, pretty pictures of Spain and Portugal just just sign up sign up right now um, so again, thank you Hershey and Lisa for everything that you brought to the table. Um, it is like, I'm completely grateful that you all, um, answered the call, um, for, for this webinar. And I'm sure our, um, I think almost like 90 something people who tuned in are incredibly grateful that you, um, are, were willing to share your stories with us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for bringing us together. Oh my, uh, I'm, I'm always, I'm always up for a party on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> which is exactly what most of the time these are for me. Um, and so again, this is just wonderful. Um, and so if you signed up for all of the webinars, I will see you um, probably in November. I think that's my next one about innovation and ministry. And then we have our Sabbath one coming up and you can sign up for all of them all at the same time. So don't you worry, you can have even more, um, even more webinars um, come in at you. So with that, again, thank you, Hershey and Lisa. For those who signed up um, for the emails, the uh, resource email will be sent to you within 24 to 48 hours, including Hershey's amazing nosy question prompts. So I can't wait. Um, and, um, and with that, let us close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together today to learn and to listen, to dream and to love, to love each other, to love you and to love our stories and journeys. Um, thank you so much for Hershey and Lisa and everything that they brought to us and everything that they shared. Let us be wise stewards of the stories that are shared with us as well as our sharing of our own. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.